Welcome back, Chappelle. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom. And some of you are like, why is he really big? I'm really, really confused. I just wanted to take two seconds to introduce this next flip to you. It is a flip that I made last year about the Crusades, right? And I know some of you are like, I hate it when he reuses old flips. But look, I, it's just hard to try and remake this one because I did it so good the first time. It transfers the information very, very well. Talks about everything I need to like actually talk about very, very efficiently. So go ahead, check this thing out. Do your best, do a good job, and I'll see y'all soon in class, okay? But go ahead and go learn about the Crusades a little bit after y'all had a fantastic discussion about Islam the other day, and I'll see y'all soon. Y'all have a good one. To, uh, us talking about, like, you know, Islam and the Crusades and the Holy City and all that stuff, right? So where we left off in class, we were talking about... Um, what were we talking about? We were talking about Islam, right? It was really, really fun talking about Islam with y'all. I really loved how much you guys knew. I was super, super impressed by that. So it was very cool to hear all y'all's thoughts and ideas on it. Very, very impressed, right? But now the big thing, though, that we do need to talk about when we're talking about the Middle Ages is the series of holy wars over this city, right? Jerusalem. So we left off in the last flip talking about what Jerusalem is, where it is, right? So Jerusalem, for locating it on a map, is in modern-day Israel, right? So modern-day Israel is the home of Jerusalem. And it's a very, very important place for a lot of different reasons. Not just because it's a holy site, but also because it's a major trade port, trade area, a hub between the, during the Middle Ages, between the growing Muslim empires and caliphates that actually exist in Saudi Arabia, going all the way through Northern Africa, but also between the Byzantine area as kind of a buffer state before like being invaded by like other different tribes or groups of people from down towards uh, Saudi Arabia, past what is now modern-day Turkey, right? So if this is Constantinople right here, this down here would be Jerusalem. So as you can see, this area right here, including Jerusalem, does serve as a kind of like the end zone between the divider of European kingdoms as well as Arabic kingdoms to the east, right? So the thing about it is, is that the Muslims took control of the Holy Land, right? Now when we say the Holy Land, we mean Jerusalem, okay? Now just so you know, though, they had had it for a while. Um, so, like, the Seljuk Turks had controlled Jerusalem for quite some time. Um, they actually didn't, like, a lot of, like, historians or high school teachers might tell you that it was like, oh, the second that they took Jerusalem, then here come the Crusaders. It's not actually what happened. They actually had it for a pretty good little bit amount of time. But it was not until they started to threaten the, uh, the Byzantine Empire, right, that the emperor of the Byzantine Empire, an Eastern Orthodox emperor, calls for help from the different uh, European kingdoms to come and help save the Holy Land on a crusade and also to basically help save them by creating a series of new buffer states between these growing Middle Eastern kingdoms and the Byzantine Empire, right? So since Turks took control of Persia and other areas, that's going to start leading the Byzantine Emperor to call for help because they're like, oh, okay, Seljuk Turks are now taking over the Persians. They're now taking over the Holy Land. They're expanding into North Africa. It is a matter of time until they attack us. So they call out to a very, very important and famous pope. And that pope is named Urban II, right? And Urban II is this guy right here on top of his scaffold delivering a series of fiery sermons after a very, very important meeting. That meeting was called the Council of Claremont, which took place in 1095 AD. At the Council of Claremont, Pope Urban II called for a great pilgrimage. Do me a favor, underline pilgrimage, highlight pilgrimage. Because as we did like notice when we were talking about Islam, pilgrimage is supposed to be a peaceful journey to a holy site, right? Not a war. So we will talk about that a little bit a little bit like later on, but it is important to remember that he did call it a pilgrimage, which is a very loaded term, right? So the Council of Claremont is going to call for this great pilgrimage to go to the Holy Land, and he's probably just hoping that the Muslims will attack, they'll turn into a war, and that, of course, him being Eurocentric and a European, he believes that they're going to have a no problem actually taking over these different areas and taking it back from Arabic like uh, warriors and things like that. But remember, the Muslims are going through a golden age right now. You're, you're stepping into a really big bear trap. Urban. But the thing is, is he calls for all Christian warriors, Un, like very important word there, warriors, which denotes knights and vassals to go and fight against the Turks. Another big thing he also tells them as well is that if you go off and fight against the Turks, it is considered a plenary indulgence, right? A plenary indulgence is the idea that your soul will be completely cleansed of all of its sins. And so if you die in this process, you will ascend immediately to heaven as a Christian warrior. 
Poe Bourbon, you're kind of uh, encouraging violence against other people and kind of along race baselines, so maybe you should chill out a little bit. But the big thing about it, though, is, is like I've said before, uh, Pope Francis and many other Catholic leaders have come out in the past and said, okay, that was a pretty dicey move. Uh, that does not reflect the Catholic faith, right? So the thing about it, though, is this is the Brother Martin mascot. This is what you believe that you're going to see when you talk about a crusading knight, right? So crusading knights, of course, clad in armor, very, very famous group of them being the Knights Templar, um, clad in armor, very wealthy, vassals of noble lands and estates, right? Heavily trained in military experience. Uh, they're going to go off fight and they believe win this war. Problem is, is that the number of people that went on this crusade that would have looked like this was actually really, really small, right? Due to the fact that the bulk of the people were actually a bunch of poor people and like washed up knights, right? So what I mean by washed up is like old knights that should have been retired and like their, their armor might have been a little rusty. They should have called it a quits early on, right? Now the thing about it though is that most of these crusaders that are going to end up going on the first crusade or actually just like poor people. And a lot of it is because this guy right here, his name is Peter the Hermit, right? Peter the Hermit. Peter the Hermit stood on top of these steps right out front of a church after the Council of Claremont in about like 1096. And he says, Pope Urban II, our Holy Father, has called for all Christian warriors to go on this crusade to Jerusalem, this mighty pilgrimage. What say you? And then all these people are like, oh, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. And it's just a bunch of poor people, though. So there's a problem that you're going to have when a bunch of poor people with sharp things go off and they're going to try and find Jerusalem. One, they're not even, none of them can read and write. None of them know where they are. None of them know where Jerusalem is. None of them know, un, don't understand that, like, you know, religious tolerance towards, like, Judaic people is probably important because, you know, they're not even doing anything in this whole thing. So you got a big quagmire issue right now. Peter the Hermit is going and freaking out and being like, let's go get them, and like, like doing all this other stuff. And it's setting up a little bit of a problem. Because the First Crusade is sometimes also referred to as the People's Crusade, right? Because about 30,000 people in total answer the call to the Crusades, which is an overwhelming force, right? And that's what, there's a big reason why this is the only crusade the Christians win. Uh, this, there are two types of people that went out. One group, well, one type of person and two groups of them were peasants and garbage knights, right? Like these people that are just wandering around. Apparently, they would get to every new city and be like, hey, is this Jerusalem? And people would be like, no, 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 no. This, this, this isn't Jerusalem. This is like Germany, bro. You need to keep going, all right? They'd be like, oh, okay, cool. You're Christian? They'd be like, yeah, 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 we're Christian. What's up? And they'd be like, okay, cool. Da -da 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 -da. And then they would keep moving. And then when they started getting into these areas down here, they'd be like, is this Jerusalem? And they'd be like, no, 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 no. You're like closer to Greece and stuff like that. This is actually what is like, you know, like, uh, like Magyar, which is like Hungary. And they're like, you're Christian? They're like, oh, no, we're Jewish. Like, so, and they'd be like, what? And then they would like burn down synagogues with people in them, right? So like the poor crusades or the people's crusade was a really big problem because they basically, as they went through and established these different states, they massacred Muslims and Jews along the way with that were completely peaceful people. That was the people's crusade. The trained knights, on the other hand, did not do this, and they were actually showing up in the wake of all of it. The People's Crusade were ahead of them. They actually got all the way through to Constantinople, and they almost sacked Constantinople completely. Because it's a crusade, also the People's Crusade is a hilarious failure, because they did eventually get to Jerusalem, <clears throat> these like poor people and terrible knights, and they were absolutely destroyed by like Muslim armies, right? Because the Muslim army showed up fully trained, very ready to go, very well equipped, and they just destroyed this giant group of poor people that had been, oh, I don't know, destroying Muslim and Jewish communities along the way. Now, the trained knights, though, of the First Crusade were strong enough to push into the Holy Land and to retake Jerusalem, mostly just because a giant group of poor people kind of showed up first and kind of weakened the Muslim forces. Now, the Christians then after that, though, the Christian crusading knights, the actual trained knights that Urban II the, the Urban the wanted to go, ended up establishing four new stronghold states. Those two stronghold states are going to be known as Edessa, Antioch, Tripoli and Jerusalem. Say hi, Mr. Morrison. It's the honors kids, and you hey. know them very well. We're talking about the Crusades. Do you know anything about the Crusades? All kinds of stuff. You have to sub today, that's all. Oh my god. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. This isn't my sub period. My sub period's E. Yes.
Ugh. All right, thanks, bud. Anyway, as y'all just witnessed me get terrible information about having to sub today, which thank God I'm recording this now, right? So now look, the trained knights, though, of the First Crusade are not are going to be strong enough to establish these four states, Edessa, Antioch, Tripoli, and Jerusalem. And now what I mean by, like, states per se, all right, so it's kind of just like little areas, right, they like establish like these little, like these little places, like almost like counties or parishes or whatever, Odessa up here, Antioch, Tripoli, and Jerusalem, and then along those states, they're going to establish like little like castles and forts and strongholds to actually protect from future Muslim attack. Now, the thing about it though is, is the second crusade, which we're only going to talk about for about like two seconds, is when the Muslims took control of one of these states, and they called for a second one, right? Oh, God, that burp was gross. Um, the place is called, though, Edessa, right? And Edessa is located right there. In 1144, the Seljuk Turks are going to invade Edessa and retake it, right? So they're going to retake it. And the thing about it is if you're going to lose one of these crusading states, that's the worst one to lose. Because as you can see, it's like close to Constantinople and also to the Byzantine. It's close to the island of Cyprus. And it's a key marking foothold that's going to actually weaken the rest of the crusading states later on in the future, right? So that's going to call for a second crusade. Crusading knights show up and they get absolutely murked by all of these Muslim soldiers. And so the second crusade is a massive failure. Now the third crusade, on the other hand, is slightly tied to the second crusade, right? Most of it due to the fact of the two men that fought against each other in the Third Crusade, right? The Third Crusade, though, is going to take place. Now, if you notice the years, though, First Crusade's 1096, Second Crusade's 1144. This crusade's going to be closer to about 1180. It's about 40 years later, right? So let me double check that, actually. Third Crusade. Um, so the Third Crusade is going to be actually taking place in 1189. Whoa! Oh my god, how do I remember these dates? Now look, the big thing though is that the Third Crusade gets called for one particular reason. This guy right here. Saladin becomes the new Sultan of Egypt, right? Now, and the really interesting thing that's going on though is in Egypt is like the Caliphate doesn't have as much power there as they want him to, and there's this person known as a vizier or a sultan that ends up taking power. And through a big progression of different lineages and a lot of family infighting, this guy, Saladin, comes forward as the new leader, right? Now, the thing about it is he has a chip on his shoulder, right? He's got a massive chip on his shoulder against Crusading Knights because they were supposed to mind their own business, but they supported people that went against his uncle and the people that were actually in charge of Jerusalem, or uh, excuse me, in charge of Egypt, right? And so he is very upset about this. He is a very prideful Muslim. He is an amazing general, and apparently he's a fantastic dad. He had 17 kids, all right? So like now, but the thing about it though is he decides to attack Jerusalem and take control of the entire area of those four states, the including areas of Saudi Arabia, he gets into several skirmishes with other crusaders nights, but he doesn't actually end up taking the city of Jerusalem quite yet, right? So he ends up taking all the areas around it though, right? And this freaks out all these Christian leaders and they decide to start a new crusade. And several nobles answer the call for this new crusade, right? That's Saladin right there. And this is one of those nobles, right? That guy right there, Richard the Lionheart. Well, the thing about it is, is like, Two other guys answered the call as well. One was named Frederick of Barbarossa. He was the Holy Roman Emperor. But funny fact about Frederick Barbarossa is he's going to try to walk all the way there. He ends up trying to ford a river with armor on and he drowns, um, which is hilarious. So his crusade doesn't make it there. Philip II, which is the King of France at the time, goes on this crusade as well. But he hates the King of England, who is the other guy going on this crusade. And that guy's name is Richard I, a.k.a. Richard the Lionheart, right? So Richard the Lionheart is a terrible nickname for this guy because actually most of the people of England did not like him whatsoever. But Richard the Lionheart tried multiple times to retake Jerusalem from Saladin, but failed, mostly due to the fact that Saladin is a genius military leader. And he positioned his military outside in the desert, knowing for a fact that uh, crusading knights from England aren't going to be able to fight in like a desert, right? Or a desert climate. So every single time Richard tried to invade Saladin's posts in the desert, he would actually end up not being able to even get there because they'd run out of supplies or they would have infighting in officers or all these other problems, right? And so basically in a nutshell, after several years of fighting, they sue for peace. And what ends up happening is Richard is going to be forced to go back to England after never recapturing Jerusalem. So yes, everybody else, the Muslims end up winning another one. So it's two to one, and then they retook Jerusalem completely, and Richard the Lionheart ends up having to go back to England. Now, the funny thing about it, though, also, 
is that actually when Richard, jot this down really quick, when Richard the Lionheart was going back to England, he actually got kidnapped and held for ransom, right? And his family actually didn't want to pay it. They were like, you can keep him. We don't like him. People in England don't like him either. They call him the Lionheart just to be nice. Now look, mm. but the big thing about it though, going into it is there were nine crusades in total, right? So there were fourth and later ones. Crusaders are going to end up attacking Constantinople and lead to the disorganization and lack strong leadership because they didn't know where they were and they ended up attacking a Christian city which caused the fourth crusade which is another failure. Five more crusades are going to follow but the Muslims are going to remain in control of the Holy Land and basically the Crusaders only ever got away with winning one crusade which is really embarrassing, right? So now the big thing about it though is we'll talk about this a little bit later on, all right? If we have time, we'll talk about it in class. But this is actually really, really important. The effects of the Crusades, right? So the effects of the Crusades are gonna be massive, okay? They're gonna have economic effects, political effects, social effects, as many, many more, right? The economic effects though, mostly though, are really important because trade and trade goods are gonna increase, right? Cultural diffusion, because cultural diffusion does occur in both war and trade, right? So even though you're going to war, you are seeing trade goods increase throughout these different empires and these different places because people are at least coming into contact with one another, right? Political changes are gonna happen as well. A bunch of these lords are not gonna return to their land since they're not returning to their land. It's gonna to lead to the king stripping that land from their family. It's gonna give the king even more power in England and in Europe and in France and in these different areas leading to the growth of the power of monarchs into the late Middle Ages, right? Social changes are going to happen as well. Christianity is going to end up isolating itself. And basically what becomes like an informal barrier between uh, the Christian kingdoms of Europe and the Muslim kingdoms of the Middle East and North Africa becomes the city of Constantinople slash Istanbul, right? That becomes kind of like this window into the other place, right? And since Christians are isolating themselves from other faiths, so it's going to lead to ignorance, racism, and negative views of these other places like the Muslims as well as the Jews. Jewish kingdoms that are Jewish communities that exist on the other side of that informal barrier, right? Now, also in the long run, Muslims are going to begin to view Christians as invaders and like people that are there to attack like their different territories and stuff. So it does actually, you can feel the reverberations of the Crusades even until this day when it comes to cultural uh, bias like towards like other different areas, of course, from Europe to the Middle East, right? Now, going into it though, also odd things about the Crusades. Before the Crusade, the church power had reached its height, right? So that actually, oh, here we go, yeah. The church power had reached its absolute height, right? Because like in the 1080s, before the First Crusade actually even happened, Pope Gregory the Seventh and Henry the Fourth were a really good example of two kings that hated each other and papal supremacy was just all ongoing, right? He, like Pope Gregory ended up like excommunicating this guy's entire kingdom and then Henry was like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, I don't want to go to hell. And then he made him wear a shirt made out of hair, right? So like it's a very, very weird thing. But nobles also would constantly fight each other for land and power. So there's an opinion on this by many historians that think that Urban II might have just wanted to unite Europe against the common enemy to keep them from fighting one another, right? Also, Pope Urban never claimed the Crusades to be a holy war. He said the Christians on a pilgrimage, hoping that Islamic groups would attack and cause the war in and of themselves. And last but not least, most of the crusaders were nobles who were leading bands of poor people. Very few of them were like just actually trained knights in general. But that's it. That's the crusades, all right? So I'll talk to y'all soon. Y'all have a good one.